In this video I will show the Hammerland HQ110 communications receiver, a vintage tube type amateur radio receiver. This receiver was manufactured from 1957 through 1962 by Hammerland in the USA. The HQ line were somewhat high-end receivers, although not Cadillacs such as Collins. It sold new for $229 to $249. In today's dollars, that would be something over $1,700, not too out of line with the cost of a high-end amateur radio today. The radio was the successor to the HQ-105 and was followed by the HQ-110A. Here are the main features of the radio. Coverage of amateur bands only, not general short wave coverage. It supports the then current 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meter HF bands as well as 6 meters VHF. It uses 12 tubes and is dual conversion except on the lowest two bands where it's single conversion. It sports a BFO, S meter, automatic volume control, noise limiter, antenna trimmer control, and a crystal calibrator. It has a standby mode and mute function for use with a transmitter. It includes a Q multiplier, a circuit that improves selectivity. I'll say more about that later. It has a regulated gas tube power supply running off the AC line. It features a solid aluminum front panel, heavy chassis, and metal cabinet. At 30 pounds, it officially qualifies as a boat anchor class radio. Let's take a look at the front panel controls. Starting from the left, we have CW pitch, or VFO, antenna trim, main tuning, which has a vernier and uses two dial windows to show the different bands, AC power and sensitivity, which is RF gain, AVC on-off switch, band switch, selecting one of seven bands, noise limiter on-off switch, audio gain or volume control, function switch, selecting between send for muting the receiving the receiver when transmitting, receive for reception of AM voice, CW SSB for Morse and single sideband reception with the BFO enabled, and CAL which turns on the crystal calibrator and also increases the receiver gain. The Q multiplier is turned on and the degree of selectivity set here. The upper knob sets the Q multiplier frequency when it is in use. At the upper right is the S meter. Between the two dials is a knob that allows moving the dial slightly to adjust the calibration. It's used in conjunction with the crystal calibrator. At the rear panel, we have the speaker connection, headphone jack, and S meter zero adjustment. There are three antenna connectors. One is ground and the other two can be used for a balanced antenna feed line or one of the two grounded and the other connected to a balance line or long wire antenna. This connector is used for break-in operation to put the receiver in standby mode when being used with a transmitter. Here it's always jumpered on. Inside the top of the chassis you can see the tubes, power transformer, IF transformers and coils, and tuning capacitor. Underneath the chassis is the wiring and all of the RF antenna and oscillator trimmer caps. And now for an on-air demo. Here we're listening to some CWs or Morse code signals on 40 meters. I'll turn on the Q multiplier to improve the selectivity a little bit. Oh, <laughs> 
And now some single sideband voice signals also on 40 meters. Finally, some AM broadcast shortwave signals, which are found uh, in the evenings often on the upper portion of the 40 meter ham band. For AM, we turn the function to receive and turn the automatic volume control on. And you can also see that the S meter is now active. Let me point out a few interesting features, quirks, and miscellaneous trivia about this unit. Despite including a lot of features, it needs an external speaker. There was a matching speaker made by Hammerlin, but you could just use it, you could use just about any speaker. This one is in a homemade enclosure made by the previous owner of the receiver. The HQ110C version included a Telecron clock timer that could be set to turn the receiver on. On the models without the clock, like this one, there's a big plastic lens over a Hammerlin logo that doesn't seem to serve any purpose. Let me say a little more about the Q multiplier. A Q multiplier is a circuit that improves the selectivity of a receiver. For narrow bandwidth signals like CW, this would allow you to hear one signal you're interested in and filter out the others. It was sometimes offered on higher end receivers of this era or as an optional add-on for lower cost receivers. Some Q multipliers were more sophisticated, but this one has a control for the selectivity and one for the frequency. If you turn the selectivity up too high, it will oscillate. The Q multiplier takes some practice and experience to use. The manual gives a short overview and then says that it is beyond the scope of the manual to be more definite on how to use it. Alignment of this receiver is somewhat daunting for a number of reasons. The procedure in the manual is terse and assumes you know how to align receivers in general. You need to adjust about 25 coils and 17 trimmers on, and on each band it's an iterative process. On 6 meters the alignment changes when it is put back in the cabinet. The manual suggests a couple of procedures to deal with this. There were some circuit changes over the years. This one is serial number 5527. This particular unit was bought used from someone who posted an ad on Kijiji. He was not the original owner, but it appears he had had it for some time. It was working and received and came with the original manual. I did a lot of cleaning and performed the alignment. For a 50-year-old radio, it was very clean inside. There are some scratches and wear, but it's in pretty good shape overall. I didn't see any circuit modifications. It's interesting to compare this to the Heathkit AR3 I recently reviewed. The basic functions of each receiver are similar. Where they differ is in the quality of case and components. The HQ110 is technically superior in almost every way, but it cost ten times what the Heathkit did. In summary, the HQ110 was state-of-the-art at the time it was made and is still quite usable today. The bands it covers are still ham bands today.